Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another session of the Beyond Access series. Tonight, we're excited to start our session on social and emotional learning. Uh, we're starting it off with Anne from uh, the Get Ready Project, very good friend of mine. Um, really, really excited. But before we dive into all of that, I want to go over some of the housekeeping items. Uh, tonight, as in every night, you all have access to ask your questions using the Q&A function. Uh, it'll look on your screen as a little button with the letters Q and A. And you also have um, some polls throughout the presentation today that are going to pop up on your screen and give you an opportunity to give your answers and we'll be able to share the results together. Uh, we'll be answering your questions uh, in the background while Anne presents. That's myself, Ori, and Suzanne, who you've all met. Um, and then we have some dedicated time towards the end to talk and take some of the questions live on the air. Um, a little uh, announcement for, because this usually comes up, is we are recording today's session and we're going to upload it tomorrow. So you'll be able to share that link with anyone who missed it and you want to share. Um, with that being all of the announcements for this moment, I want to hand it over to Anne. Welcome to the series, uh, and we're really excited to have you. All right, thank you so much, Jose. Welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Um, my name is Anne Buckley Reen, and I am an occupational therapist and a therapeutic yoga instructor. And I run a movement program in New York City schools, and I've also coached many, many parents on sleep strategies and sleep issues over the years. So welcome. I'm going to put the PowerPoint up on the screen and we'll take it from here. All right, so let me get my slideshow and here we go. Okay. So first and foremost, the mission is for us to prepare all of our students and all of our families to be in optimal physical, behavioral, and emotional states, to be calm, to be happy, to be healthy. We want to support the physical and mental health and well-being of everyone. So let's start at the beginning. These three cups represent three students. And what we know is that we're all different. When we support our brains and our bodies, there are different parts of our brains and bodies that we need to pay attention to. We need a body and a brain that can cope and adapt to the challenges of life. So these three cups, as I said before, represent three students. And the, the cup all the way on the right, the cup that's all the way filled up, this represents a student who is full. They've had a good night's sleep. They've had a good breakfast. They got some exercise. They got a hug from a parent. And they're in a great place to start the day. This is a student who arrives at school happy, and in a good place for learning. The next student, the student in the middle, is represented by the half full cup. And that's a student who didn't have such a good night's sleep. This is a student that didn't eat breakfast or maybe just ate a little bit of something that wasn't so great. And they're half asleep on the school bus and they get to school and they pull themselves together. But by 11 o'clock, they've had a meltdown, they can no longer pay attention. And for the rest of the day, it's very challenging for them to be in the classroom. The student all the way over on the left, as you can see, that student has an empty cup. And that empty cup signifies a student that has no coping abilities. That's a student that arrives at school very stressed out, is very overwhelmed, this is a student that may not have slept, hasn't had any kind of supportive environment, perhaps. Um, this is a student that is just empty. And the idea behind tonight is that we are going to discuss two ways that we can help our students, our children, fill their cups up so that they can cope with the demands 
of life, of school, of developing. Okay. So here's to filling our cups, our coping chemical cups. So there are four things that influence how our brain and body works on a daily basis. These four areas are sleep, how much movement we get, and the quality of the movement, and also the nutrients, the fuel that we take into our body, and the environments that we're in. So when I say environments, I mean not just the places we are, but the people that we're around, because people are part of the environment as well. Tonight, we're going to focus on sleep and movement, okay? So first things first, it's important that we look at daily routines. Whenever we want to incorporate changes and supports for our children, we like to build them into their daily routines. So routines that we all have, we all wake up in the morning. When we wake up, we get dressed, we do our self-care routines, we may eat breakfast, but our morning routine is getting ready for the day, okay? Self-care. Another part of a morning routine can be exercise, movement, preparing our brain to be ready for the day. Other parts of our daily routine include mealtimes. Typically, we eat three meals a day. And often those meals are at the same time each day. So that's part of our daily routine. Schoolwork or homework that happens after school. This is part of our routine and typically many children do their homework at the same time every day. Exercise and movement after school or outside playing or having playtime, this is part of many, many students' daily routines. And then the last part of our daily routine is bedtime, getting ready for bed. And as many of our students that have bedtime routines, there are also very many others who don't. And that can create a lot of problems when it comes time to calm down and rest and go to sleep for the evening. So sleep is essential for survival. It's when our brain recharges and restores. It's when our immune system strengthens. If you are getting sick and you go to bed nice and early, your immune system and the rest that you're giving your body can really help to restore and strengthen your body, okay? So our immune system strengthens when we're sleeping. Our brain stores important information and creates long-term memory when we're sleeping. When we sleep, our bodies are at rest, but our brains are not. Our brains are very active when we sleep and their activity is essential to almost all the things our body does during the day, all the body's business. So the consolidation of memory, to learning, to mental health, to our body growing and repairing, okay? So sleep is really truly essential. Bodies and brains grow while we sleep. Now, how much sleep do we need? So I want you to take a look at this chart and see how close your child is getting to meeting sleep requirements by age. So the chart starts at the top with newborns who sleep 14 to 17 hours a day. So look at the chart, see how old your child is and how many hours a day of sleep they should be getting. And what we wanna know is, is how many of our kids are actually getting as much sleep as they should be. Um, also, I wanna point out that if your child has 
special needs, developmental challenges, they very often require additional sleep. This is a body and a brain that's working harder. Okay. So short changing sleep, not getting enough sleep has serious adverse consequences. And what we know is that children in, in, in America, American children get too little sleep. And there are many contributing factors to this. In the past 20 to 30 years, the average amount of sleep a child gets, regardless of their age, has been reduced by approximately two hours a night. And there's a lot of reasons for that. A very big reason is the use of media. Over the past 20 years, we have extended our use of media from watching TV to everyone having a lot of electronics. So there are electronics, you know, um, iPads and computers and cell phones, and many of our children have access to electronics 24 hours a day, okay? Back in 2007, a study that looked at 1,200 adolescents found that television and computer use were each independently associated with later bedtimes and less overall sleep. The study also found that the amount of TV viewing at age 14 was significantly associated with trouble falling asleep, as well as the number of sleep problems experienced at age 16 and 22 years old on follow-up. So they saw what they were doing at age 14 and they found that there were significant issues um, further down the line, okay? A study in Japan found that playing video games for more than an hour each day was associated with greater prevalence of shortened sleep duration. What we know now is that many children take their phones to bed with them. In Belgium, 20 to 40% of adolescents reported being awakened at least once at night um, or more times by incoming texts. And these were students who reported significantly higher levels of daytime sleepiness, okay? So there's a lot going on behind the scenes with media use. Um, another interesting um, article that I read, a, a research study that I read, also talked about passive versus active viewing. And what this means is, is passive viewing is when the TV or the computer is on, a show is going on in the background, but um, the child is not actively sitting and watching it. There's just that electronic use that is going on in the room. And that can have the same amount of impact on sleep as sitting and actually actively watching the show. So having it as background can be just as detrimental, okay? Um, another thing that was discussed in that article was parental oversight. Parents have a lot more ability to monitor what their children are doing in terms of computer use and, and media access. But adolescents who have their own um, electronics can pretty much have access to lots and lots of media throughout the day and night. And this can create a lot of issues. I know personally, many families who've reached out to me whose children are up throughout the night using technology. So I think it's really important that all of our children understand the why of sleep. And I explain to kids that when we sleep is when our brain and our body grows, our muscles get bigger and stronger. We grow. Without sleep, that's not going to happen. It's really hard to remember what we learn if we don't get a good night's sleep. And we will get sick much easier if we don't get a good night's sleep, okay? So those are just a few of the reasons, but if you want to be better, stronger, smarter, and healthier, you need to get a good night's sleep, okay? That's the basics. So the why is, you know, 
I used to say to my own kids, if I really didn't care, I'd let you stay up all night. But the thing is, is I want you to be healthy and strong and calm and comfortable and alert. And so it's time to go to bed, okay? So developing good sleep habits. How do we get our kids to develop good sleep habits? And good sleep habits are, are things that, that really help to support getting a good night's sleep. So the first thing that's really important is having a set bedtime. And when I showed you earlier um, our, our list, having a set bedtime, I'm gonna show you bedtimes for certain age groups in a minute. OK, it's really important that that said bedtime that we follow this and that we go to bed at the same time every night and get up at the same time every morning, including weekends. Now, it can take up to two weeks for this cycle for kids to to be able to establish that. So don't worry if it's if it doesn't happen right away. But what you want to do is be consistent and talk with your child about what what time, bedtime is the appropriate time to get enough sleep, okay? And then you wanna work on your sleep environment. And that means that I am not going to sleep in a room where the TV is blaring and where there's people coming in and out. I need to have a quiet space to go to sleep, okay? And the other thing is, is that we need to develop calming sleep routines. Brains and bodies need to learn how to calm down to prepare for sleep. And these should take place before we go to sleep each night. So about 20 to 30 minutes before bedtime, we get ready for bed and we do our sleep routine, okay? So I'll talk to you a little bit about what that looks like. So first things first, we get where we're going to sleep ready. We want to remove clutter. We don't want to have lots and lots of stimulating things. You know, a child who's got a, a room full of toys, we need to put our toys to bed. That might mean just covering them up with a sheet, but that means they're done. Okay, no more playing. It's time for us to rest. There should be no electronics in the bedroom. This is important. And this is going to be a challenge for many of our students who go to, to go to bed with TVs on or computers or smartphones. So we let the student know, we let our children know, we're not telling you you can't have this, but what we're saying is, is that you can't have this at bedtime. And actually an hour before bed is when we want to turn our electronics off, okay? We wanna make sure that the bedroom is dark, quiet and at a comfortable temperature. Some children may be afraid of the dark. That's actually very quite common. So having a low light on until it falls asleep is fine. Once they're solidly asleep, we can turn out the light. And you can even have a motion detector light that can turn on if the child needs to wake up to go to the bathroom, for example, okay? Um, so that the child won't be fearful in a dark room. But in order for the brain to produce melatonin, the sleep environment needs to be dark. And that melatonin is the sleep hormone that helps to restore our brain and our body. It's what helps us to feel well rested, helps us to get into a deep restorative sleep, okay? It requires darkness. And for a sensitive child, we need to consider pajamas, um, and the sheets that are on the bed so that the child can be comfortable. Many times children don't like their pajamas. They don't feel good because they're more sensitive. Their skin is more sensitive. And I say, you know what? Wearing daddy's t-shirt inside out, if that's the most comfortable thing to sleep in, that's fine. We need to find sleep clothes that are comfortable for the child, okay? So sleep strategies. First things first, we want to set a bedtime. And if we've got preschoolers, 7.30 should be the, the bedtime. So seven o'clock, we begin our sleep preparation, okay? For school age students between eight and nine, so younger school age students, we begin their preparation for sleep at 7.30, okay? Um, older older uh, elementary school age students, 
It could be eight o'clock or even 8.30 that we're preparing them for their, their um, going to sleep. And high school, really what's recommended is, is that high school students should be in bed by 9.30, but 10 o'clock is more realistic. I know many high school students that are up until midnight every night, okay? So um, this takes a little looking at to determine how are we going to do this? And this is something that is, can be particularly challenging with our adolescents because in adolescence, your circadian rhythms change and it's harder to fall asleep earlier, okay? Adolescents stay up later and tend to sleep in later, which doesn't really work if you have to get up for school. So 30 minutes before lights out, here are some of the things that we can do. First thing is taking a warm bath. Taking a warm bath in and of itself is relaxing and calming. But what happens when you take a warm bath, when you get out of the bathtub, your body temperature drops. And when your body temperature drops is what happens in the first stage of sleep. So when you get out of the warm tub, you get a nice deep rub down with the towel, you get your pajamas on and you go straight into bed. Your brain and body are now ready to, are prepared for sleep, okay? The next thing is, is that you want to read a calming or rhythmic book. You can read a nursery rhyme book for a younger child. You can read poems for an older child or just a calm story that you're going to, to read to the child in a low voice, or you can play bedtime music. So I have samples of music that when we finish the PowerPoint, I will share with you. Um, the the uh, bedtime music includes Baby Go to Sleep and a relaxation music that's available on YouTube. And both of these have been used by many, many families to help their, their children go to sleep, okay? Um, and then, the last thing is, is that we're going to dim the lights and we're going to turn them off once the child is asleep. Now, just a quick story. I worked in a preschool and there was a four and a half year old boy who had temper tantrums all day long. He could not stay calm for anything. And I had a conference with his mom and dad and I asked them, what time does he go to bed? And they said, oh, he doesn't go to bed. And I said, what do you mean he doesn't go to bed? And they said, he's never tired. And I said, you know, he might not look like he's tired, but everybody gets tired. What happens when children get overtired is that they, they have a, what we call a second wind and they can get revved up again. So it looks like they're not tired, but actually now they're overtired. They've missed the window of opportunity to be able to fall asleep. Okay. And so what I did with, with is we went over this calming routine. I gave them calming music. We set the time that they were going to start the routine. And that night at 730, this boy who had never gone to fallen asleep before one o'clock in the morning, he fell asleep at 730. Okay. And his parents were amazed, but the school was amazed because the next day, when he got off the bus, he was smiling. It typically took two people to get him off the bus because he would arrive at school. His mother would put him on the bus asleep and hand the bus driver his shoes. And when he would arrive at school, they would wake him up to bring him into school and he would have his first meltdown of the day. He was coming to school on only four and a half or five hours of sleep. And he had severe self-regulatory problems. So. This child really made me begin to ask every parent about their child's sleep, sleep hygiene and sleep habits. And this child really taught me a lot because within a week, he was a totally different young man. The, within one week, the, the temper tantrums absolutely stopped. And because his brain was now producing those coping chemicals that he needed to get through the day. Okay, um, his attention span in the classroom significantly improved. He could sit in a seat and listen to the teacher instead of pacing back and forth. So, so many things changed. So sleep again is very, very, very powerful. 
Remember that when you are using sleep hygiene, it takes two weeks to form a habit. Doing the same thing every night helps our children follow the routine. And for children who like to follow a schedule, having a chart helps the child know what's going to happen next, okay? Again, we want to pay attention to the environment. Um, we want to use the tools provided to calm the body and the mind for a good night's sleep. And so remember that we are the environment. We need to be calm. Our voices should be calm and low. And we want to follow the schedule. A get ready for a sleep schedule that can be so helpful for our students. Okay. So common sleep issues. And at this point, we're going to ask you some questions about your own children and, and possible sleep issues. So Ori's going to post some questions for you. It looks like the responses on, on here, Anne, are pretty equal across the board. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm seeing. Okay, so let me just go through, um, go through the answers and I'll just give you a couple of cues about this. So children who have difficulty falling asleep often have difficulty calming down. For children like this, we wanna be careful about having too much activity or technology after 5 p.m. and no sugar in the evening. So having sweets and sweet desserts can be a stimulant, okay? Um, so we wanna remove things that are going to stimulate the brain and include things that are going to be calming. Excessive use of technology, we talked a little bit about that at least one hour before bedtime. And depending on how old your child is, there are limitations on how much technology the child should have access to. We know once kids are teenagers, they have a lot of media access, but talking to them about limiting it to an hour before bed is important. Children who wake at night, sometimes children wake at night. These can be children who have not eaten enough protein during the day. Protein food converts to hormones that help us to sleep. So protein is eggs, fish, meat, nuts, seeds. Protein foods um, eaten for breakfast or lunch are going to then help sleep 12 hours later, okay? So that's one reason. The other reason that children wake at night is because they wake for contact. And those are often children who, who don't feel, they may have poor body awareness, they may not feel safe in their beds, and so for those children, some techniques that we use is using a weighted blanket or a weighted animal so that they can feel contact when they're sleeping, feeling a bit of pressure, um, using a, a, um, a motion detector light so that the child, when the child gets up, that the light goes on so the child feels safer, okay? Um, there are some other strategies, but those are basic ones that help, that help so many of our kids. And with our children who have difficulty waking up in the morning, first we wanna look at what time they go to sleep at night because we need to push, we need to make the bedtime earlier. That is a sign that the child is not getting enough sleep. The child should be waking on their own, um, you know, in enough time to be able to get up and get ready for school. So we may have to make bedtime earlier because that's a child who may need 12 hours of sleep, okay? Okay, so I hope that was helpful. And I'm going to, okay, can I move the poll off my screen? 
Yes, you should be able to close it out of your screen. Okay, uh, let's see. Hmm. It doesn't seem to be allowing me to, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Let me take, move this over. Or if you launched it, you might need to you need might need to turn turn the poll off on your screen. Okay, Ori, can you turn it off? Because I think Ori, poll ended. Let's try that. I did end it, so I'm just um, just trying to make sure I can edit it again. And, and we're only we're only seeing about half of your screen right now. Yeah. There we go. I just moved it off the poll just to see if it would if I could move the poll. Are you still seeing the poll on your end there? Yeah. So it's difficult. I'm I'm not able to. Um, okay, I'm going to see if I can just move on to the next slide. Okay. So at this point, what we're going to do is take a quick movement break. Okay. And what I want you to do, we've been sitting and talking now for half an hour. I'd like everyone to join me in standing up. And I am going to stop the share for a moment so that I'm up on your screen. And I still have the poll right in the middle. Oh, now I can move it. OK. So what we're going to do now is just a simple sunrise and sunset movement. So standing up, I'd like you to reach your arms up over your head. Breathe in, arms up. And then as we breathe out, let's bring our hands down to our feet. OK. Inhale come all the way up and then exhale and fold all the way down. Let's do that two more times. Breathe in, come on up and then breathe out and fold forward. Again, inhale, arms come up and then breathe out and fold forward. Good. From here, now let's just do a little twist. So let your arms swing around your body and just twist a little bit. Now let's do this five times. One, two, three, four, and five. And let's sit back down. Notice if you will, any change in how you feel after doing our little movement practice. Okay, and if you'd like to, okay, let's see. So it looks like at this point that the majority of people are feeling more alert, more attentive and more awake. And we just did about two minutes of movement. So you see how much movement can change the way our brain is feeling and also the way our body is feeling. What we did was we reached our arms up in the air. And when we reach our arms up, this is an energizing movement. When we bring our head down, bringing our head towards our feet, that also stimulates alertness, okay? So we alerted our brain we energized our body and we also helped to calm our body. So we're calm, but alert. When we did our rotation and we twisted from side to side, that help, that's an organizing movement. And then it helps to pull us together. So we call this sunrise and sunset and also elephant pose, a little pull yourself together. This is a great way to start the day, especially for a child who can be sluggish in the morning, okay? It's a way to wake up and to stimulate the brain by bringing the head down to the feet and then the arms up in the air. And this can be particularly helpful for children who are non-ambulatory, who are in their wheelchairs and who don't have an opportunity to move or change the position of their head in space. This um, activity can help to support their being able to um, achieve more a, a better and higher alertness state. Okay. All right. So thank you for participating. And let's see if we can move our poll out now. Okay.
Very good. So let's talk a little bit more about movement because movement is absolutely, it's, it's an essential for every day. Movement impacts on our attention span and you saw that with just two minutes of movement. It also influences our behavior and our ability to self-regulate, to stay calm across demands and across environments. If you exercise, if you do simple movements on a daily basis, what you're going to find is, is that you're calmer, you're more organized, you feel better. And the program that we've done in New York City schools actually starts the day with our students with 15 minutes of a very grounded movement practice, a yoga-based practice, where we get on our mats and we stretch and we move our bodies in space. And what we found after doing that program is the teachers noticed that the students pay attention better, they're much calmer, they're much more independent, um, and they're able to sustain attention throughout the day. So it's not just for 20 minutes after the activity, but it is over time, it lasts all day long, okay? Also, movement can help our endurance and our immune function. And that's one thing that was noticed was that the children in the classes that were doing the program were kids who their attendance was much better because the rate of absenteeism for students being ill was much less, okay? So brain benefits of exercise, okay? It, improve, it improve, increases the production of the chemicals that promote our brain's repair. So it helps cellular repair, helps build our brains, helps to improve our memory. It lengthens our attention span. It boosts decision-making skills. It prompts growth of new nerve cells and blood, blood vessels, and it improves our ability to multitask and to plan. So how much movement does a child need? Okay, exercise is an important part of every day. And we need exercise to strengthen our heart and our lungs and to stimulate our circulation, to fire our muscles and get ready for all of the activities of the day. The recommended amount of exercise is 30 minutes a day for students in grade school. Um, and younger children and those with developmental challenges need more. As a therapist and as someone who's worked with families for more than 30 years, I believe that every student needs at least 10 minutes of movement before they go out to school, before they get on the school bus, 10 minutes at home, simple movement or walking to the school bus. These are activities that can help to support our children being the best that they can be throughout the day. Okay? So what kinds of movement are helpful? Well, for toddlers and preschoolers, I love crawling. I love pushing and pulling activities and then going to the park, climbing on monkey bars, running, walking, wheelbarrow walking. And that's one that many of our students can do at home, whether they're toddlers or whether they're teenagers who hold onto the child's feet and they wait there on their hands and walk across the floor. And if you hold their feet up a little bit, their head is down. And this is a really great wake up and strengthen exercise. You can maybe just go five or six steps across the floor, but it really helps to stimulate their brain and their body. Um, for students with limited mobility, if you go on YouTube, you can find a program called Seated One. This can also be used with students who are very reluctant to move and it can be done by the whole family. It's a seated movement practice, okay? Also, there's another practice for students who wanna do yoga, and that is called the Get Ready Project, and that is on YouTube as well. These are free and available on YouTube. For our elementary and high school students, great activities, dancing, put on music and move to the music. I like to start with one song and then I will build the students up to two to three songs, which is about 10 minutes of movement. So the movement can be, they can walk, they can jog, they can dance, but we want it to be rhythmic and repetitive, okay? And music is energy. So music produces the rhythms that we need for our body to move and be organized. Dancing can be incredibly organizing for the brain and body. And dancing also helps us with coordination. So dancing, jogging, walking to me is one of the best exercises there is. Um, and just walking 
and weight bearing is pumping our hearts. It's helping to increase our circulation. It's getting more oxygen to our brain. And so helping our children who really don't get too much exercise to, to do a little walk in the morning. I suggest to parents that if you're walking your child to the bus stop, take the long way, walk around the block to get to the bus stop. That's what I used to do with my son so that we would get extra steps in. And then we would count our steps and we would keep a chart in the kitchen of how many steps we walked each day, okay? Um, climbing, climbing activities at the playground can be really wonderful. These aren't always accessible in the morning, but climbing activities, hiking, so going out and walking in nature, great activities for our students, okay? Running, but be careful with running for students who don't have boundaries. Some of our students will run, but won't be able to stop. And for those students, it's best for us to start with more grounded types of activities, okay? Um, and we can do marching in place. I find that for students that may take off, that when we count or when we sing while we're moving, it helps them to stay organized and to stay on track and to stay with me, okay? Also, when you have an opportunity, if you have an opportunity for your child to get into water, bodies, especially our kids who really have a hard time organizing their bodies in space, being in the water can really help our students to feel their bodies more and it helps them to organize their movements, okay? And then simple stretch and strengthening exercise routines. So in our bodies, we can stretch, we can elongate, we can curl up and flex, and we can twist or rotate. And these can be done on our backs, sitting up or standing up. So there's lots of different modifications for these simple movement practices, okay? Most important, we need to move. So what kind of movement or exercise is best, again, there are many different ways to exercise and there are many different levels of energy in the children that we're working with. So, as I said earlier, walking is simple and free. What we want to do though, is we want to explain to our children, why are we exercising? And we also wanna keep track of our exercise. So make a chart. Kids love to keep track, hang it on the refrigerator, give yourself a star every day that you've done your walking, or your stretching or your yoga, and also figure out what type of exercise would be best for your child. I have found that working with kids who've been very reluctant to move, that doing a simple yoga practice is a way of opening the window to movement. Very simple, and we don't expect the child to do every pose, but we expect them to follow along and you can get on the floor right next to them and you can model for them. So it's helpful for the parent as well as for the child, okay? The resources I put up there on the screen, again, just like our sleep routine, we wanna put it in our schedule and we wanna do it at the same time each day, okay? And what happens if children don't wanna move or if they don't move? Well, when our kids don't move, what ends up happening is often a lack of energy or sometimes an increase in anxiety, okay? Um, because there's no outlet. And so when we move, we also produce calming coping chemicals in our brain. So we may see slowed metabolism, kids who get tummy aches, kids who have difficulty digesting their food. Um, we see poor endurance, poor attention. And movement can also, lack of movement can affect moods and memory. And what we found when we began our program, our movement program in school, we sent notes home to parents after six weeks and we asked them what they noticed at home. And 40% of the parents noticed that their children were sleeping through the night for the first time. So movement each day, and we want to move, make sure that we're moving before five o'clock in the evening. Movement is going to affect the quality of our sleep at night, okay? So again, that simple sunrise and sunset that we just did, you can try that in the morning just to get the body moving. It's a great place to start, okay? And what about students who can't stop moving? 
Okay, so really briefly, some, some kids who need to move all the time have poor body awareness. And when they stop moving, they really can't feel their bodies too well. So there's kind of always a motor restlessness. And what we found with those children is that if we do a brisk walk in the morning, if we hang from a chin-up bar, or if we wheelbarrow walk, if we do this for five to 10 minutes in the morning, and then we observe, what we often find is, is that they settle down. That need to move constantly is reduced because the signal from the body to the brain is stronger, okay? All right, so what we ultimately want is 20 to 30 minutes a day of aerobic exercise, of active movement, okay? Again, we can start small. We can begin with five minutes before school, five minutes before homework and increase it from there. But put it on your schedule and try to make it part of every day. Okay, use music or counting to establish a rhythm or find some great music to move to. And Jose had some great music on for us, some great movement music when we started. Um, take baby steps and make them giant steps. Okay, see what your child can do and encourage them. Be proud. If they do two minutes of exercise, our goal for tomorrow is three minutes, okay? So again, I always say meet children where they're at and then help to guide them where we want them to go. And this will help them as well as us. So let me just tell you a really quick story about my buddy Ramel, and then we're going to take some questions. So Ramel was a high school student in, in um, District 75, and Ramel was a boy who did not want to move. He did not want to participate in the classroom movement program. He basically said no to everything, and he had challenging behaviors. Um, and so when everyone else was doing their movement, here is Ramel reclined on the floor, okay? So I'm going to come out of this screen share and I am going to see if I can, I'm gonna stop this share and I'm going to take you to another, where's my buddy? Hmm. He disappeared, hold on a second. No worries. While you pull that up, Anne, right now, folks, the, the, for those folks watching, is the time to hit that Q&A button and type in your questions so that okay, perfect. we can have them all queued up. All right. So for some reason, I am having difficulty here, but I will figure it out. Hold on one second. I'm still a co-host, aren't I? You absolutely are. Hmm. Hmm. So I had him open. Let's see if this will take me to him. Hmm. All right. I'm going to pop out of here for a second. I think I have to reopen his. Um, video. Okay, so I'm going to do this really quickly. Let me come out of the PowerPoint and okay. Am I still with you? Yes. All right, I found him and I'll do this very, very quickly. Okay, here we go. So here is the story of Ramel. And the goal for Ramel was to get him moving, okay? So his teacher, wonderful teacher, um, let's see if we can get this going, okay. I'm gonna view the slideshow. I apologize, you guys. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here he is, he's in a high school class. Uh, loved to hang out, but didn't like to move at all. And he was highly reactive. He didn't want to participate in any movement activities. And so what happened was we met and we discussed how can we get him moving? And so his teacher was great. 
she found a bunch of, of um, inspiring people that Ramel really liked who do regular movement. So the police officer who does yoga, Superman was doing yoga, NFL football players, and he loved football and really was very inspired by that. So, um, so what happened was Ramel started to practice yoga. And here he is sitting up in his classroom. And from that, then he started to really enjoy how his body and his brain felt. So he showed that he had a marked decrease in his negative behaviors and really great improvement in his positive behaviors. But not only that, Ramel felt better about himself. And so he says here, I'm in front of myself and I feel calm. After, after yoga. So he felt proud of himself, so proud of himself that he decided that he wanted to participate in the end of year program. And here is Ramel, the child who never moved. Did Ramel go from being a student stuck in no to being a student who was energized and positive and engaged? Um, he really went underwent a whole gigantic change. And the energy of movement and the organization of movement really helped to move him into a whole different place. So he's our hero. He's our hero of tonight. And I'm going to wrap it up now. And let me go back to my PowerPoint and just give you the um the final resources okay uh, i think we're here all right last thing i want to say and we're running out of time and i apologize is um okay just in terms of of you caregivers who are here with us tonight it's really important that we practice what we preach that we always take five minutes for me so some simple things that you can do for yourself is learn some breathing exercises, progressive relaxation. These are wonderful resources and they're available on fragrantheart.com. They're free. I recommend them to all parents. Um, listen to soothing music, take a walk in nature whenever you can. Don't be worrying about what you have to do next. Take five minutes for me. Always try to get a good night's sleep and be a movement model for your children. Okay. All Thanks right. so much, Anne. I think we have time for a couple of questions that, that have been sure. popping in. Um, so I'm going through the Q&A here and um, folks are asking, how do you deal with a child who free wakes up frequently in the middle of the night um, and because they're scared of the dark or because they just feel uncomfortable? What are the things we can do to, to kind of like, I get, I get the kid to sleep but then in the middle of the night, it's the wake ups. Okay, so very often children who have what we call, what a therapist would say is um, reduced body awareness. They don't feel so safe in their own skin. And so they're looking for contact in the middle of the night. So during the day, activities that you can do, wheelbarrow walking, um, pushing, pulling, dragging, carrying, doing some heavy work activities to help the child's brain and body connection be stronger. Okay, these are activities that during the day will help sleep at night. Also, um, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, you can make a sleep buddy where you can take a stuffed animal, open up the front, put a one pound bag of rice in there and sew it back in. Now you've got something that's weighted that the child can hug and hold while they're sleeping. For older kids, you can use a weighted blanket. Um, you know, these are just some tools. I make my own weights with one pound bags of rice 
and I put them in socks and tie the, the top of it. And those, just a few of those weights around the child at night can be very soothing because they feel, they can then feel their body and feel safer in their bodies. Okay. That's a, that's a great suggestion on the, the sleep buddies. It's, it's a, yeah. it's a great inexpensive way. Cause I think sometimes we think of these things and as very expensive and not accessible, but <clears throat> A one pound bag of rice is only a couple of dollars at the grocery store. And I'll tell you what, those one pound bags of rice don't open the plastic. My one pound bags of rice are 20 years old. Okay. <laughs> they will last forever. Keep them in those socks. You may change the socks, but the bags of rice will last forever. Okay. That's good to know. So we have another question in here about um, a parent who's saying that their child uh, is involved in after school sports. Okay. But, but still have a really hard time waking up. And I'm wondering if this has to do with the bedtime routine. Yeah. So sometimes, so after school sports can be wonderful. Um, is the child coming home? Is, is the child getting enough sleep at night? Because if they're not, if they're not able to wake up in the morning, it might mean the first thing we always do is push, make bedtime earlier. Because they may, may, they may need to generate more sleep so that they have the energy to, to do all of that physical work after school, okay? So let's see if you move bedtime up by a half an hour or an hour, if it's easier to wake up in the morning, okay? It's a great thing. That's the first step that we would try. Love that. Um, and then, of course, I would say also, as a reminder of all the things you said at the beginning of, like, what's the electronic situation? What's the device situation? And if it's like, you know, if, if your kid has a cell phone, Maybe it's, you know, the hour before bed, no electronics. That's right. Um, so can you go over again, uh, what, are, what are some great exercises for kids who are hyperactive, who just can't stop moving? Okay, so when kids have an excess of energy, they need to burn it off. So for these kids, um, you can do aerobics, but sustained aerobics. So running. And when we have kids run, they can run, you know, we tell them to do running every other day and to do heavy work on the alternating days. So heavy work would be pushing, pulling, dragging, carrying, okay? I had moms that had like the five pound bottle of water at night before they went to bed, they would pull it into the middle of the kitchen floor. And in the morning, their child's job was to move the heavy water bottle, to push that out of the way. Okay, hanging from a chin-up bar, just hanging. Full body traction is very calming. It helps the brain and body to connect. Wheelbarrow walking, having the child's hands on the floor and holding onto their feet and having them walk across the floor on their hands. That is also a lot of weight bearing into the body. It helps to release coping chemicals. Yoga, believe it or not, can also be very calming for hyperactive kids, depending on the type of yoga that's being done. I like to do a one that where we start with the kids in standing and we do a repetitive movement um, sequence that then we end on the floor with progressive deep relaxation. So we meet them where they're at up here and we bring them down. Okay. And I think we're going to have to have you come back again because the questions are non-stopping. And I think we've really, really appreciated you sharing the all the information and especially Ramel's story. I think that was really inspirational for all of us. So thank you for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure having you tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody get a good night's sleep. <laughs> All right, folks, we're going to, we're going to wrap up for tonight, but next week we're going to keep the social emotional uh, series rolling and we're going to be joined next week by the child mind Institute. So until then we'll, we'll be uh, uploading this video recording to the YouTube channel and you'll hear from us soon. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much. And Jose, I want you to please send me the name of the song you were playing the, the movement.